This is the In Focus podcast from the Hindu. Hello and welcome to the Hindu's In Focus podcast with me Amit Barua your host for this episode. After several failed efforts the United Nations Security Council managed to pass a resolution on the 25th of March calling for an immediate ceasefire for the month of Ramzan in Palestine. Resolution 2728 passed because unlike on three previous occasions the United States chose not to use its veto power but instead abstained. The resolution passed 14-0. In a related development, the International Court of Justice warned on March 28 that the prolonged and widespread deprivation of food by Israel to the Palestinians meant that famine was setting in in Gaza. Also, the UN Special Rapporteur on Human Rights, Francesca Albanese, said on March the 26th that there were reasonable grounds to believe that Israel was committing genocide against the Palestinians in Gaza. Since October last year, Israel has killed at least 32,000 Palestinians and injured another 71,000 following the Hamas attack in which 1,200 Israelis were killed. To discuss what the UNSC resolution and the ICJ order mean, I am joined by Syed Akbaruddin, former Indian permanent representative to the United Nations in New York and a keen observer of world politics. Welcome to the Hindus in Focus podcast, Akbar. Thank you very much, Amit, for having me on your podcast. So Akbar you know lots has been happening on the Israel Palestinian front for the last several months and now we have this uh, UNSC resolution what do you make of the resolution and what impact is this likely to have So Amit um, you know uh, the international landscape is littered with efforts to try and address issues in the Middle East um, in fact from an international multilateral perspective the issue of palestine or middle east goes back to the very foundational years of the un the first resolution i think uh, on creation of a two state solution goes back to 1947 um, we are still now looking at can a two state solution be a viable option so more than 70 years have passed there have been many efforts and unfortunately despite all the best efforts these haven't proved to be successful so what it basically conveys from an international institutional perspective is that if the ukraine war revealed that uh, international institutions were no longer fit for purpose in an era where there is a return to great power rivalry the events in gaza confirm that hypothesis everything about the gaza war or most things about the gaza war go against international law the brutal barbarism of the attack on israeli civilians the mass retribution against palestinian civilians the restrictions on humanitarian assistance the wholesale destruction of gaza hospitals schools deliberate starvation of the population etc everything is in violation of international humanitarian law so it looks like the developments of the last 70 years are have not taken place because we are back to a situation when the strong do what they can and the weak suffer what they must and this goes back to the realist two cdds who said this the conflict of course is not confined to what is happening in gaza but there is a fear that it has the potential to grow into a larger regional conflagration hence the multiplicity of good intent efforts to try and contain it through the icj through the un security council but frankly it's not uh, something that has succeeded uh, so far and it doesn't augur very well because some of us may not be interested in the middle east but the interests of all of us will be impacted by what happens in the middle east so it's better to keep focusing not be dismayed by what may not be successful uh, but to continue our efforts towards trying and addressing a to contain the issue b to try and resolve the issue 
So, Akbar, uh, we saw that on three previous occasions, the U.S. Uh, vetoed uh, draft resolutions, but on this occasion, they chose to abstain. What do you think has led to this change in um, the U.S. position? So, both the U.S. and Israel are impelled by domestic consideration. And by that, I mean the U.S. Uh, and President Biden's administration have come under increasing pressure that they have not been addressing issues which segments of the Democratic uh, Party feel very strongly about. Also, uh, there are large segments of Muslim population as well as Arab populations in two or three, at least in two key battleground states um, in Wisconsin and in Michigan, for example. Both these states were carried by President Biden last time, but appear to be um, very difficult this time. And therefore, to address some of those concerns, the U.S. has moved slightly. Now, there are differences which have emerged between the Biden administration and the Israeli administration. For example, the Biden administration publicly calls for a more for more humanitarian assistance, restraint in the impending Rafah military operation, and support for a Palestinian state. And we see every day that the biden BB grudge match has made for great copy. But it has given a signal of slight change, but it has not dented U.S. support for Israel in the war on, ha- on Hamas. On the other hand, Netanyahu hasn't given much ground and feels little pressure to do so. Frankly, most Israelis are aligned on the war. The need for an operation in Rafah to achieve what they call as total victory over Hamas. And there are no grassroots coalitions clamoring for restraints in Israel. Um, So the big challenge for Israel from its perspective is that how does it reconcile two big goals that it set out for? One, it said that it wants the destruction of Hamas. And two, it wants the hostages back. Now, several people feel that these are irreconcilable. Uh, a, because destruction of a uh, movement is a difficult task, as the Americans realized themselves in Taliban, uh, in Afghanistan, uh, when they wanted to destroy the Taliban, it's back in uh, authority. Similarly, the Israelis, when they went to war, for example, they took over the Al-Shifa hospital in Gaza, and they said they had taken over, they had cleared the tunnels, etc. The moment they left it, now again they are back, See, uh, besieging the hospital, saying they have killed 200 more in the last 10 days. So you can see there is a resilience of the Hamas, which is difficult for them to totally destroy. So given these conflicting challenges or goals of Israel, given the demands that the U.S. Uh, Biden administration has in terms of assuaging certain segments of its population, The outcome was a signal to Israel that the U.S. may not be fully on board on everything that Israel wants. So that's the basis of this U.N. resolution. Uh, But but we saw soon after, uh, you know, the Hamas attack, uh, which killed uh, uh, 1,200 Israelis, we saw Joe Biden making a visit and standing alongside uh, Netanyahu. Uh, in Israel. And also, if uh, all the reports are to be believed, that the munitions and the weaponry that has been used by Israel against the Palestinians is of, you know, a lot of it is of U.S. origin. So how does that reconcile with this now, this attempt to distance itself slightly from Israel? So I think the operative word that you use is slightly. Uh, What the U.S. has done is slightly distance, but you've seen when they made an explanation of vote, the American ambassador, in fact, said that this is not a binding resolution. This was repeated 
by the State Department as well as by the National Security Council spokesperson. That the resolution which was just passed, 14-0, is not legally binding. So you can see they're already backtracking from what uh, they were forced to do in terms of public diplomacy. So frankly, it's not unusual for the U.S. to backtrack. This happened during the last period of President Obama uh, after the election results were announced in 2016. The Obama administration also uh, abstained on a UN resolution which opposed the building of illegal settlements in West Bank. Even though the Trump administration, which had uh, signaled clearly that it would not abide by these. So signaling, uh, accepting, uh, moving out from the, uh, what giving from one hand and taking from the other is what US policy in the Middle East has been all about. So I wouldn't think that it will lead to a rupture. It's led to differences. Those are signals. Uh, and those signals serve a purpose. I'm not saying that they don't serve a purpose, but I do not expect uh, these signals leading to a rupture. Uh, Akbar, for the benefit of the In Focus podcast listeners, can you explain this distinction, if at all, there is one between a non-binding and binding resolution of the UN Security Council? Right. Uh, this is a philosophical debate, and many countries use this um, issue. So, the argument generally is that the Security Council resolutions under Article 25 of the UN Charter, uh, there is a provision which says that all states must accept and carry out the decisions of the Security Council. So the operative word here is decisions of the Security Council. Now, uh, there are different segments of the UN Charter. There are some segments which uh, are uh, what we call Chapter 7, where if you do not implement those resolutions, they can be further measures taken. There are some or most other parts of the UN Chapter are not, do not have this threat of a forceful implementation of the decisions. Now, the US argument is that this resolution, which was passed uh, recently, is not under Chapter 7, which will lead to forceful implementation. And their argument is the following. They say, first, there is no reference to Chapter 7 in this resolution. Second, they also go by the words that are used in the resolution. So their argument is that the language that is used does not talk about the Security Council decides. It uses the uh, language such as the Security Council emphasizes, the Security Council urges, the Security Council calls upon, and it also uses the word the Security Council demands. Now, demands in most people's view is enough. However, a demand, if it is not met, is not covered under Article 25 because Article 25 of the UN Charter calls for decisions. It does not mention demands. So the US interpretation is that this is non-binding. And in any case, it will have to have another resolution which will fall under Chapter 7 to implement it. And the US is never going to accept a decision which will allow forceful implementation against Israel of issues that it has not met. So both in the case of the Security Council resolution, as well as the ICJ resolution, there are no self-triggered implementation mechanism. And the reality is the US will never allow any further resolution, which will trigger off a forceful demand on Israel uh, as against um, generic urging, um, emphasizing, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So that's the fundamental difference. It's a philosophical difference, but is also an important difference in international law. And the U.S. has taken refuge under that 
it clearly signals to Israel that, yes, please be careful. We are signaling to you, but it also signals that this does not mean the a rupture in our ties. So, Akbar, tell us, in the past also, you know, Israel has shown uh, considerable uh, uh, impunity in, uh, you know, n- not implementing past UN resolutions. So, you don't really believe that this is going to add up to any pressure on Israel in a sense? So, Amit, if you look at the history, there are more than 140, I think, UN resolutions on issues relating to Palestine of one sort or the other. And you can see for yourself, are we better off today with those resolutions or not? The answer is pretty clear that most of these resolutions require a further trigger mechanism. And the US has always ensured that the next step is not taken. So yes, it's a signal. It's a signal of displeasure of some sort between uh, differences between Israel and the U.S., but it's not a signal that we abandon you. uh, There is now a rupture. Get ready for the difficult phase further. And history shows that U.S. has not gone down that path. Certainly, with the U.S. elections coming up, with possibilities of a change in administration, these are all up in the air, and I wouldn't uh, place too much. For, for example, look at this resolution itself. It calls for a ceasefire in Ramadan. After two weeks of Ramadan, it called for a ceasefire. We are now five days since that call. There's still no ceasefire. That leaves about a week plus left in Ramadan. So you can be certain that there will be another attempt by some other country to try and have another resolution which says beyond Ramadan. So these will be minor changes. They don't change the big landscape of the situation of the Palestinians, either through the ICG decision or through the UN Security Council. Those solutions will come through backdoor, uh, backroom uh, discussions in Doha or wherever else. Akbar, what is your sense? I mean, you did refer, you know, in your initial comments uh, to, you know, how, in a sense, uh, the UN has become quite ineffective. And even now, you just mentioned about the inability of the UN to act, especially on account of the veto power uh, the US has exercised in favor of Israel. So what does this, because, you know, in the last few decades, perhaps the world has seen a lot of death and destruction, but this kind of uh, destruction that we are seeing of a people uh, in, in Palestine is quite unprecedented. So does this mean that the world will just have to watch uh, whatever is going on there? Um, I'm at, um... I don't think that the world will watch. They will make the attempts. Uh, Having said that, it's true that the uh, governance, global governance mechanisms that we set up are not adequate for the challenges of the present century. And that's because they have a design flaw. And that design flaw is by design. It's not by mistake that they created a sort of a flawed Uh, institution. And that was that when a great power is involved, you cannot, the rest of the institution cannot progress. So you've seen that in Ukraine when Russia was involved. You're seeing that in the Middle East where the US is backing Israel. So by definition, the global governance system or the UN Security Council can address second degree issues cannot address and resolve the top-notch issues which bedevil all of us. And that's the design flaw. Those issues will have to be taken out, discussed separately and implemented. And we shouldn't even think that those issues will be resolved in a multilateral forum where all states have a role to play. Those issues will be resolved in small backdoor backroom discussions in small plurilateral efforts and then brought for a imprimatur of the multilateral system. And that's the design that has been there always. That's the design that you will have to look at and be realistic enough to acknowledge. 
So, Akbar, one of the things that we've been seeing, you know, that, uh, that today, uh, you know, the use of force by countries, you know, without uh, authorization from the UN Security Council is growing. I mean, we have a recent case in point when Iran and Pakistan have hit each other, you know, because uh, they claim that terrorists are operating from their countries. And Iran has also hit other countries of late following uh, a terrorist attack on their soil. So does this mean that, you know, the rule of international law that an effort was being made to put in through multilateral institutions, is that totally out of the window now? It's a great question that you've asked. And what you are basically saying that the norms that have evolved over the last hundred years or since World War II, are they being challenged? So my answer to you is, yes, they are being challenged in multiplicity of areas, whether Azerbaijan and Armenia, uh, whether Guyana and um, uh, Venezuela, uh, whether you mentioned some others, Pakistan and Iran, Afghanistan and Pakistan, or look at the rise of non-state actors. Hamas, by definition, is a non-state actor. Houthis, by definition, are non-state actors. Hezbollah, by definition, is a non-state actor. So you can see that the rise of non-state actors and the willingness of state actors to get what they think is theirs forcefully is now more evident than before. Why does this happen? This happens when there is a changing of order. The old order doesn't carry the same force that it did in the past. The new is yet to be born and broadly accepted. So it's a twilight zone. And in the twilight zone, we can expect more non-state actors to uh, flourish, more states who think that this is the best time to get what they want, which they have desired for long, use the opportunity and do it. So get ready for greater turbulence until a new order is established. And we don't know when that order is going to be established because we don't even know what to call it. We used to call it a bipolar order when the Cold War was there. We used to call it a unipolar order after the Cold War. We say that it is. we would like to have a multipolar order now, but that is not yet clear. So until things stabilize, there will be these anomalies or situations where state, non-states will try and maximize their advantages. I'm going to go back to the International Court of Justice order. You know, which was delivered on the 28th of March that pointed to the, you know, prolonged deprivation of food by Israel and calling for an immediate opening of, uh, you know, convoy food, food and other assistant convoys into um, Palestine, into Gaza. So is it your sense that, uh, you know, this will be implemented or we already have Israeli spokesmen saying that they are allowing aid to come in, but due to operational reasons, this is not, uh, they are not able to deliver it. So, Amit, all judicial decisions are always not going to ameliorate immediately. It's normal for the judiciary to act in a way which is more considered and which sets precedence for the future rather than addresses effectively and immediately a problem. So while the ICJ has actually, this is the addition to the provisional measures that they've made. The initial provisional measures were announced on 26 January. They've now come out with a new additional set of provisional measures. Uh, and as you said, because these are all linked with the issue of genocide. Now, Genocide has a very high bar to be proven and it will take months or years for this proven. All these are preliminary or interim measures to address the bigger issue of genocide. And I would think that these are all tactical in nature. The Israelis will also say, yes, we opened, but we want to do security checks. Yes, we've increased the number of uh, uh, land crossings. But we cannot give up security because self-defense is a key argument of Israel in this whole thing. Um, 
they will also say we abide by the uh, genocide convention we have no intention of um, violating it but i would think that all these cumulatively the security council the icj order will increase a little bit of pressure on israel ultimately it will be up to an israeli government in consultation and in cooperation with the us to see how much it will be able to adjust and how much it may not be willing to move around and that's the negotiation that will take place initially prime minister nathaniyahu said that the team which was going to the us is now cancelled now he is walked back and said it's postponed and we will really look at another date etc and all uh, so in some small measure these do play a role but again these are not substantive uh, measures uh, these will be ameliorative and tactical in nature Agwar, I want to also discuss with you, you know, uh, we've discussed the role of the U.S. Uh, currently, but I want to discuss the role of some other countries. For instance, uh, the ICJ uh, process was triggered by South Africa. And we also see a lot of support uh, for the Palestinian cause coming from uh, Ireland, you know, which has uh, really taken the lead in some ways uh, in, you know, in telling Western leaders what they think of the situation there. So what do you make of countries like this and how does that impact Israel's international standing, if at all it does? So uh, you're right that um, there are two, uh, South Africa, clearly predominantly, but also Ireland. So both these countries, I think we need to look at them from the perspective of their own experience. And what is their experience? Uh, South Africa, like India, is a developing country, but its entire approach to activism internationally is very different from ours. Their argument is that South Africa gained freedom, also was able to overthrow apartheid because of engagement globally. And therefore, South Africa lays much store with global activism with global engagement, with a willingness to push internationally, rather even on issues which other countries may not find palatable. So South Africa is a case of on many issues, whether it's on um, on Palestine, but you look at them on disarmament, for example. They take an activist role, arguing that unless you move globally, it will be difficult for individual states to change their policy. That's South Africa's lived experience. It's very different from our own. In fact, it reflects how India used to approach uh, international issues in the late 40s when we brought apartheid to the global platform or decolonization. We were the chair of the decolonization committee. So in our foundational years, India too, as a developing country, was activist in this. South Africa is in that phase of where it feels that global engagement improves rather than impedes a solution of problems. Ireland, again, traditionally, Ireland has been the broker within even the EU on Palestinian issues. And given their own independence struggle, they have had sympathies for independence or freedom movements. And Ireland... Always, if you look at Ireland's voting also, it either pushes the EU in a direction of greater neutrality or sometimes is an outlier within the EU. So both these countries are based on their lived experiences that continue to impact their foreign policy processes. Um, other countries have moved on and have different approaches. Uh, but South Africa and Ireland both are of the view that global engagement is better for resolving intractable uh, issues, even if those issues are of a nature which only one country has to solve or a small group of countries, they feel that global pressure will help rather than impede. Agbor, before I let you go uh, for this episode, I just want to quickly ask you, you know, uh, the what is china's position in all this it's a very important player in the in the world today what is its position on uh, the palestinian issue 
So China has been increasingly taking an active role in resolution of global challenges. So you remember they tried and facilitated an agreement between um, Saudi Arabia and Iran. Uh, however, China also realizes that the Palestinian issue is much more difficult. And therefore, it has, in a matter of speaking, gone with the rest of the world and has thrown in its lot with the Palestinian cause. It has, even when the Houthis were using, um, trying to uh, impede the flow of trade through the Red Sea, China was saying that the solution lies in Palestine and it was not very supportive of attacks on the Houthis, even though trade was being impeded. Uh, China sees that if it has to take over leadership roles of the global south where it increasingly is putting its effort, it will need to be seen as empathetic and sympathetic to concerns which are uh, aroused in the global south. And the Palestinian issue, let me tell you, has brought support uh, among large sections of the global south. And China sees this as a good opportunity to castigate the U.S., to indicate how it is uh, uh, following uh, hypocritical uh, approaches uh, in uh, Ukraine vis-a-vis -vis, um, uh, uh, Gaza. And it also burnishes its credentials without directly engaging. So it's a rhetorical stance. It's a stance which gains it uh, public diplomacy points, but it has kept away from direct engagement because it realizes both it does not have right now the capacity to do much, but also the challenge of getting involved in this is of a different level than trying and being a promoter of global good. So China has the cake and wants to eat it too. Well, thank you so much for all that, Akbar, for your perspective, a broad perspective on, uh, you know, the uh, the conflict itself, the resolutions and the implications uh, for global politics. Thank you so much for talking to the Hindus in Focus podcast. Thank you very much, Amit, for that opportunity that you've given me. In Focus will be back soon with analysis of the biggest news issues. In the meantime, you can find our podcast on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, Stitcher and other platforms. Just search for In Focus by The Hindu. We'll see you soon.